All right. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Well, that's really bright. Uh, thank you for coming. So my name is Marlo Navides. I'm from the uh, Mediterranean Institute of Oceanography and the Institute of Research for Development in France. And this is the work of uh, Sophie Bonnet, led by her, and it's a, a great part of the thesis, the PhD thesis of two students, Hugo Bertello and Mathieu Caffin, who did a lot of the method development that I'm, I'm going to talk about. Okay. So why should we care about nitrogen fixation at all? So um, in the top left graph, you have a distribution of chlorophyll in the oceans. And as you see in the subtropical gyres, uh, chlorophyll concentrations are very low. And this is because uh, there's no uh, nitrogen available there. So this is limiting uh, primary production. So it is in these large areas of the ocean where nitrogen fixation emerges as the main source uh, of fixed nitrogen into the system. So that's why we care about it so much. So who fixes nitrogen? We call them diasotrophs, and they are mainly cyanobacteria. We have the filamentous ones, like trichodesmium. We also have filamentous diasotrophs that live associated to diatoms, what is called DDAs. And then we have these unicellular groups that are smaller, and they are basically uh, classified as groups A, B, and C. And then we have these non-cyanobacterial diasotrophs. On the other end, they can be bacteria or archaea. They are very diverse, and we don't know very much about them, actually. So what our question here is, what happens to the nitrogen that is fixed by these diasotrophs? Where does it go in the water column? So um, what happens is that we have this atmospheric nitrogen that is dissolved into seawater, and then it's fixed by the diasotrophs. So it, it is primarily used to build up that new diasotroph biomass, or so for growth. But actually, a variable amount of it is also released out of the cell as ammonium and dissolved organic nitrogen compounds. So then it is becoming actually available for other non-diasotrophic plankton. Other planktonic groups are going to use this fixed nitrogen. So depending on which kind of these two scenarios is dominating, uh, the effect on organic matter export or in the biological carbon pump is going to be diff different. So if diasotrophs are just sinking, they're contributing to direct export. Whereas in, if the fixed nitrogen is transferred to somebody else, it is the sport of the latter that will contribute. So we are trying to um, compare these two modes of export and what's the role of fixed nitrogen on them. So how do we actually do this? Well, it's quite tricky because, of course, in any given liter of seawater, we have this fantastic diversity of uh, little uh, organisms. So it's hard to come up with something that can allow you to measure who is doing what and uh, to what extent. So to overcome this, we worked on a single cell 15N nitrogen approach. Um, so what, basically what we do is that we add a 15 nitrogen to our samples and then we track it down to DON and to ammonium, but also to all these groups, so to the diasotrophs, the heterotrophic bacteria, and then some main groups of uh, non-diasotrophic phytoplankton. Of course, uh, this, all these cells, they have different sizes, so the analysis that you have to use is always different. So for the larger ones, you can do microscopy, like for diatosome, trichotesmium, but then you have all these tiny creatures, and then you have to use like, flow cytometry sorting to tear, to tear them apart. To analyze the, uh, the uh, nitrogen uptake for each one of these groups, we use uh, what is called nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometry, or nanosims. So basically what we do here is that we uh, shed a beam of uh, ions into the surface of, uh, of the cell of given interest, and we recover the secondary ions in different channels. So basically by doing the ratio between the different channels, you can tell what is the 15N enrichment of uh, your cells of interest. So, uh, there's a whole process there to measure how much uh, this diasotroph derived nitrogen is transferred to somebody else. So first we have the enrichment per a given cell, then uh, we count how many cells of each group we have, either using microscopy or flow cytometry depending on their size. And then we convert their biovolume to uh, nitrogen content by using uh, conversion factors. So, Altogether, this allows us to upscale the nitrogen uptake per cell to nitrogen uptake by group of cells, and finally to estimate the transfer, so how much nitrogen that is fixed by diasotrophs is transferred to other groups. So our experiments are mainly performed in the Western Tropical South Pacific Ocean, which is a, an area of high uh, nitrogen fixation activity, as you see in this map here. And I'm going to talk to you about two different experiments uh, 
performed in the past three to five years. The first one is a mesocosm experiment. So we had a triplicate set of uh, mesocosms of 55 uh, cubic meters, and we deployed them in the New Caledonian Lagoon. New Caledonia is somewhere between uh, Australia and New Zealand. In case you don't know, I didn't either the first time I went there. <laughs> and, and well, working with mesocosms, of course, has many uh, drawbacks, but it has a main advantage. That is that you get, get advection out of the equation because it's a closed system. So that allows you to calculate budgets within the mesocosms. We added phosphate at the very beginning of the experiment to make sure that nitrogen fixation would not be uh, phosphorus limited. And we observed uh, the development of contrasted diisotrophic communities, as I will show you now. Okay, so this is the uh, time course of the experiment. Uh, it lasted 25 days. So at the very beginning, we observed that these DDAs, these diatom diisotroph associations, they were dominating the um, diisotrophic community, whereas there was a tremendous shift, like very dramatic to using C uh, that were uh, detected up to 10 to the 5 nifage copies per liter uh, in the second phase. So this was uh, kind of unexpected and we wanted to know, so okay, so what's the nitrogen transfer and the effect on export in this phase where is it in comparison to the second phase of the experiment? So we uh, measure a number of things, and what we observe is that the nitrogen fixation rates were actually much higher when the UCNC were present, and this was uh, also reflected in uh, particular organic nitrogen concentrations in the water column, and importantly in the sediment traps that are placed at the very uh, end of the, uh, the very bottom of the mesocosm. So it seems there that UCNC are actually contributing to direct export very importantly, and this was kind of unexpected because so these DDAs, they are diatoms, so they are really heavy and they are usually contributing more to direct export as it had been observed in, at Station Aloha and also in the Amazon River Plume. But here we observe these little tiny guys, they are actually contributing to export very, very importantly as well. Uh, we, we calculated the, um, the export uh, efficiency and translated to POC, so to carbon, and yes, of course, the UCNC were contributing more to export than the DDAs. And this is what happened. So at the very um, top of the, of the mesocosms, they were aggregating already, forming the smaller uh, aggregates. And as we went down in the water column, they ended up forming these huge aggregates, about to uh, somewhere between 100 and 500 microns in, in size. So they were actually contributing to direct export very importantly because they were sticking to each other and becoming larger. So uh, when comparing these two sources, okay, so they are contributing to direct export, but what about indirect export as well? So we used uh, this nanosims approach, and uh, we calculated that out of starting with 100% nitrogen, about 50%, so half of it stays as uh, using C-biomass, but some 16% uh, is released out of the cell as DON and ammonium, and then a significant amount of the fixed nitrogen is transferred to other groups. So there's some 18% going to picoplankton, uh, just 3% to the atoms and then some 11 to the, the, the rest of the other groups that we analyzed independently. So it seems that UCNC could actually contribute to potential uh, indirect exports as well. So okay, so we have the two groups that we observed in the, in the uh, mesocosms here, but I guess that uh, any nitrogen fixation people in the room, you may be wondering, what about trichodesmium? And yes, of course, I'm going to talk about trichodesmine too. So this is a cruise from New Caledonia, down here, to uh, French Polynesia. And we use an adaptive uh, Lagrangian strategy, and this allows, us, allows you to um, come up with like a, an eddy or a water mass and just follow it, be on top of it during five days. So this is kind of similar to what happens in the mesocosms, right? You, you are uh, trying to diminish uh, lateral advection as much as possible. So I'm gonna talk about um, station A here uh, where we deployed these uh, sediment traps to also measure the exported flux. So what we observed is that uh, mm, trichodesmine is actually detectable in the trap material and they contribute up to 8% of POC export at 330 meters but only 5 at 500 meters. So it seems like they are not um, contributing that much uh, to direct export. Uh, we did NIF, uh, NIFH accounts on the trap material and this may seem very large numbers but this is per liter of uh, sediment. So it's hard to compare to water column measurements. Then uh, the nanoseams data showed that actually uh, 
50% of the nitrogen is fixed, is kept as trichotesmium biomass, but they release this 40%. And this, then part of it is transferred to other groups. So 7% goes to picoplankton, little by diatoms, two diatoms, and then a mix of uh, other groups get some 2.5%. So if the, the question was if different diasotrophs are different, are contributing different, differently to, um, to transfer, and the answer is yes. So it seems that DDAs contribute mostly uh, to direct export. Using C, do kind of so and so, depending on to what degree they are aggregating or to what degree they are staying in the water column. Whereas trichodesmian does very poorly at direct export, but they actually release a lot of the fixed nitrogen as dissolved form, so this becomes bioavailable to the rest. And so, gracias. And if you're more interested in these experiments, there are two special issues out. So this is the Mesocosm experiments project by INE, and then there's the Outpace crews, and there's a lot of nitrogen uh, fixation related work on those. So I, yeah, I recommended them to you. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's tricky. Well, of course they float. They have a gas back wall, so they tend to float. But then um, they have this also this autocatalytic death pathway, so they can PCD. So when they when they die and they form this huge aggregate and they do actually sink, and you can see them in traps, like even very surprisingly, is still kind of maybe active. Like I have RNA samples from uh, trichodesmid and. 1,000 meters. So they do sink, but I guess that they are very juicy material and they, yeah, I think that probably the bacteria on the way destroy more, most of it. So it, yeah, it's not, it's not the greatest contributor to direct export, I guess. Okay, thank you.